How about the pyramid scheme? Of course, WFG is an MLM or a network marketing company. Mm-hmm. Um, some people say, well, they're all pyramid schemes. Well, mm-hmm. How do you respond to that? So py- pyramid schemes, it's interesting what pyramids, and when people say a pyramid, right? Because pyramids first of all, are illegal in the United States, right? You can't be involved in in a pyramid and pyramids don't have anything that you're exchanging, right? Right. So, so in other words, you give me money, but I don't get anything for it. Right. I don't think most people understand it when they say it's a pyramid. They don't really know what a pyramid is. Exactly. Right. There's no, and it was the old day where, where I put in $2,000 into a pool, you put in $2,000 and we get eight other people to put $2,000 in there. And the first guy who started this pool walks away with $16,000. Right. right? Then the next guy who put in 2000 gets his eight friends to put in eight, you know what I mean? They should do it through letters in the mail. (laughs) When we were kids, my parents used to get the letters, exactly, chain letters, those types of things. Exactly. So to me, that's a pyramid, right? right? Right. But when a pyra- but it's not a pyramid when you're actually giving money and you're getting an exchange for something, right? That's actually a sales transaction, right? So how is it a pyramid or a scam when if you're going to buy life insurance, you post a premium, let's say, of $30, and you're getting back $400,000 of life insurance coverage, right, as an example. So God forbid you die. Does that make sense, right? Sure. And insur- a, a major insurance institution is now going to pay your beneficiary a death benefit. Okay, that's not that's not a pyramid to me, right? right? Uh, or if you were to go buy a phone at Apple stores or whatever, you're, that's not a pyramid. Okay, right? And then some people say, well, the products aren't pyramid, but your company is. And I'll say, well, what do you mean by the company is? And so they'll say to me, a, a, a pyramid design. Is what corporate America is, right? Because you got how many presidents in a major corporation or any sure. corporation, right? right? There's one president, right? And how many vice presidents are there? Maybe two or three, and it, it and it comes down like a pyramid where you got all the rank and file, and then you got all the employees at the very bottom of the food chain, sure, who will never in their, in their lifetime ever make it to the top and become the CEO of their company. So to me, corporate America is the true, right? Uh, of is the true pyramid. Whereas our company, I am a, an entrepreneur that have come in and WFG has provided me the infrastructure to provide me an opportunity to build my business, right? So just like if you own a company and you're going to get your payroll done, who would you go to? You would go to a company like Paychex or you go to ADP right. and they provide your payroll. I look at WFG as my payroll company. Right? They're paying my organization because if I've got, let's say, 10,000 people in my organization right now and they actually have to have uh, their payroll done, instead of me trying to do 1099s for everybody and, and W-2s for my, my administrative team, WFG handles all that for me. Sure. Right? So I love that idea. You know what I mean? And it's almost like WFG is almost like a, a union okay? it, so that everybody comes together and we have more bargaining power. Right. So that if I went to a major company like Nationwide, right, or, or, or Pacific Life, and I said, listen, I'd like to get a contract to sell your products, they're going to ask me, hey, how, many, uh, how much production can you do? Right. And I'm just a small little mom and pa guy. This is my wife and I, okay? Maybe one agent. And I say, well, I think I'm going to do like $200,000 a year in premiums this year. Nationwide is not going to give me the time of day. Right. Right. Number one, they're concerned about liability. Is this guy has no experience? He just got licensed. Right. And now he's going to sell our products. We're wondering if he's even uh, understands our products to sell it, and it, uh, could they jeopardize our company? Sure. Right. So now, what I WFG is where I come in, and let's say you and others and Bob and Sally and Jim and Betty, everybody comes together, and now collectively. Through WFG, representing us, goes to a nationwide and says, we'd like to have a contract with you, but we will do X number of business. We're actually going to write $10 million of business with you. Now nationwide says, that's a good amount of premium. We'd like to give you a contract. How can we ensure that you're not going to do something to jeopardize our company? WFG says, we're going to put the training in place, the infrastructure in place, the compliance in place to make sure that everybody knows how the product works and how to sell the product. So that's what WFG brings to the table, right? Okay. It's tremendous value. It's like, it's like a McDonald's franchise, right? Where it's not a franchise, right? But it's similar to one, right? Where like, if I wanted to start a... A lot more inexpensive. It's a lot more expensive, exactly, (laughs) right? But if I wanted to start a... uh, uh, a Subway or a Capriati's or a, or a Burger King or a Kentucky Fried Chicken, 
right? I'm better off going to a company like that and buying into their infrastructure rather than me trying to go make my own hamburger business, right? You know, it's interesting that I'm pretty confident you and I could make a better hamburger than McDonald's, right? With all sure. due respect to McDonald's sure. Corporation, we can make a better hamburger than what McDonald's. Right. Well, then, but then why don't we have thousands and thousands of locations selling our hamburgers? Right. They have a system. They've got a system in place. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, sure. and so it's like Starbucks, you know, Starbucks didn't invent coffee. Right. Right. But, but, you know, there's a Starbucks at almost every, what, two, three miles, there's a Starbucks. Sure. In some cities and, and municipalities, I've seen Starbucks right across the street from each other at That's every right. corner. Yeah. Okay. And so, right. you know, how is that? Starbucks has now got a system to, to, to open up very successful enterprises, you know? What about people, John, that say, well, I went to a WFG meeting and they were chanting. Some of them they had the same color shirts on and they do this whoosh thing. And it's kind of cultish. The people that say WFG is a cult. How do you mm. respond to that? That's, that's a great question. So, number one, not all offices do that. So, every office is pretty much independently owned and operated. So, the fact that, you, that you're independently owned and operated, you can move your team and motivate your people however you'd like. Right. So, for instance, there, there are some offices that may do that. And then there's some offices that don't even know what a whoosh is. OK, <laughs> so it's not every office that does that. But the offices that do do that, you have to ask yourself, well, what are they doing? It's it's to it's about teamwork and it's about the camaraderie. It's about celebrating. Right. When someone gets a promotion, where someone gets uh, 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 closed, a big transaction. Right. And it's no different than a, a football team or any professional team. And it doesn't even have to be professional, even at the collegiate level or even in, in your local football games, you know, flag football or local soccer games and your kids are playing in. Right. They all wear the same jerseys. Sure. OK. They're all celebrating. They're all high fiving. And most of these people even have cheerleaders on the side, right, with pom-poms screaming up and down. So it's interesting that we don't say anything about, about football teams, baseball teams, soccer games, basketball games. But suddenly when you do that in business, right, it's, it's weird. It's, it's cultish. It's, and, and I think what, what it is is that most people have to realize that, that if, you're, if your company isn't doing something like that, you might be working at the wrong company because, number one, they don't know how to have fun, right? They don't know how to enjoy and celebrate their wins, Sure. right? Because if you go to other major companies like Walmart, Walmart does the same thing. They sure do. That's right? right. Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. go to a Google, right, campus, they all do the same thing. Right. You know, you go to Apple, they do the same thing. So why are they cultish too? Are they a scam? Are they weird? Are they, you know, it's just that maybe the company you're working for is just hasn't adopted how to celebrate wins and have fun and, and develop a, a team culture in their environment. Sure. Some people say, as you know, that the FFIUL product is, um, is a faulty product because as you get older, the cost of insurance goes too high. What do you, what do you say to that claim? Mm. So number one is that that is actually not a true statement. Okay, the cost of insurance does not always go up every single year. In fact, it can actually go down. It's actually based on your mortality, right? And there's a the, these actuaries actually will study the mortality of, of people, right? At certain ages, men, women, that there are certain ages that there's a higher mortality than other ages. So mm -hmm. people think that it goes up actually every single year, but there's actually some years that actually goes down pretty much because they say people don't die in that year for whatever reason. The mortality is not very high at that year, hmm. right? So it doesn't go up every single year, right? And, and so if, and there are certain companies where the cost of insurance remains the same for 20 or 30 years, right? So it really depends on the carrier and who you're doing business with. Certain carriers, it, it, it may go up slightly, right? And some carriers, it actually goes down. Some carriers, it actually stays level and constant, right? Now, some people say, well, I don't really need that. I don't have a, you know, this is a wonderful vehicle where I can actually invest my money, right? And, and. There's a, in certain permanent insurance policies, right, i.e. universal life or index universal life or variable universal life, there's a variety of different permanent kinds of policies. You actually have a cash value account, right, where in that cash value, according to the Internal Revenue Code, that the money that's in this cash value actually grows tax deferred, which means you pay no taxes on it, okay? And there's several codes. One is actually Internal Revenue Code Section 72, 
right? And then the second one is called Internal Revenue Code Section 7702. And then another one is called Internal Revenue Code Section 1.01, .01, subsection A, paragraph 2. Right? So these internal revenue codes now allow a taxpayer, a participant who wants to put money in there that can actually qualify for an insurance policy can get that and have a, a cash accumulation where the money's growing tax deferred. But guess what? You have no market risk. For instance, if you put money in an indexed universal life, there's a guaranteed floor. So that floor could be either zero or 0.75 or 1%, but every insurance company has a floor, okay? And then there's a cap, and that cap could be 12%. It could be 14%. It could be 15%. Some companies may say there's no cap, okay? But to have that, you got to have the insurance as well. So it's a wonderful place for you to put your money into these places and, and uh, Ben Baldwin actually calls it the financial Swiss army knife, right? And so everybody's got a different name for it. Anthony Robbins just made a, uh, has a book out there and he talks about, he calls it the rich man's IRA, mm -hmm. rich man's Roth IRA, right. okay? And so if people understand that it's not just the cost of insurance, it's all the other benefits that go with uh, FFIUL. There's chronic illness, there's terminal illness, there's long-term care benefits, Right. If you uh, disability benefits. So if you were disabled, right, uh, you can actually take, you know, you need some long term care needs. They'll actually take in some carriers, for example, will take uh, two percent of, let's say, the death benefit. So if the death benefit is five hundred thousand, they'll take two percent of that, which is ten thousand. And you'll get an income every single month tax free of ten thousand dollars. Right. That will help you if you were if you became sick or disabled. So. So it's a product that you believe in? Oh, absolutely. Is it yeah. a product you own? Oh, I've got, oh my goodness. I think I probably have, I don't know, 15, 20. Wow. IULs and VULs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What about people that, that they want to sell insurance and they look at WFG, they compare it to a traditional company and they say, well, the commissions are so much lower initially, at least with WFG. Why would I you know, go into WFG when I can get three times the commission at another you know, a traditional company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's, a, that's another thing. It's, it's the, so much of that goes on in this industry today where they'll say, oh, well, you only get you know, 30% or 40% or 50%. That's your contract with WFG. But it's, it's 30, 40, 50, 70, 80% of what? Right. That's the question is, what is the actual payout to the field? So, for instance, uh, I met a fella and he says, listen, man, I, I get a I get a 70 percent contract. Like right now, my contract is 70 percent. I go, wow, that's 70 percent. I said 70 percent of what? Right. Of 100 percent of 90 percent or 70 percent of what? And he said, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I guess of 100 percent. Right. So he went back to the insurance company and he asked them, he said, hey, what's my contract? I'm getting 70% of what? I don't think I've ever asked you that. And he said, I'm getting 70% of 40%. So the payout to the agent is only 40%. So mm -hmm. he's now getting 70% of 40. So if I took 70% of 40, that's actually only 28%. Right. Right. Whereas if you say, well, we're getting, we're paying out 50%, we'll say, wow, you're getting 20% less. Well, 20% less than 70. What? But wait, 50% of what? what? Right, yeah. yeah. We're, we're paying out almost 130%. So if we're paying out almost 130%, if you get 50% of 130, you're actually getting paid 65%. You're getting almost double what you were getting at the other company. Hmm. So be careful what you're getting, what you think you're getting. You know, I had one guy said, well, no, I get 90%. And I said, you get 90%? And he goes, yeah. And I said, of what? And he says, that's a good question. He goes, I get 90% of 90% because the broker dealer that he works for and the insurance company he works for, they pay out 90% to the field. Mm. So you, oh, wow, that's pretty good, right? 90% of 90% is what? Yeah. 81%. That's yeah, a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Okay. Well, they go, well, what, what's the highest contract you're going to give? Well, my highest contract, let's say, would be 81%. Right. So let's just say 80% for the sake of numbers. Right. So if I took 80%, right? Of 130%, what am I getting? I'm getting 104%. So I'm actually getting paid a lot more, right? Plus a little bonus on top of that over the 100 right. with my contract. And then I asked him, I said, by the way, what's your quotas? And he goes, oh yeah, I have to write a half a million dollars a year in premiums, not life insurance face amount, 
and five hundred thousand dollars in premiums mm. a year. And I said, "Well, what happens if you don't?" And he says, "Well, I get fired." So there's quotas. Okay, you got to do minimums. Whereas our company, you could do nothing. You, you can write zero business, and you can still maintain your contract. Mm. So we don't have minimums. So yeah. What do you say to people that say they went to a meeting, a WFG meeting, and they felt like it was a hard sell culture, people really pushing them to sign up? What do you say to, to those people? Well, I'm sure there are certain offices that do that, okay, whereas most offices don't, right? Again, everybody's independently owned and operated, so you can pretty much run your own operation the way you want. So these offices that are doing hard closes, it's because... Uh, they don't understand the business yet, right? And so they're just recruiting people to recruit, right? And, and, and eventually what they're going to have is an adult daycare center, right? And so I don't have that model. Because you don't get paid when people sign up. No, right? you don't, right. right. So you don't get paid when people just sign up. There's actually no compensation whatsoever. So why would they push people so hard to sign up? I think they don't understand the business yet. It's, it's they just want to get a recruit to get a recruit, okay. right? As if it's something like they think that they're going to get something out of it, or but there isn't. They're not going to get anything. In fact, my company, or my organization, uh, if you come to a meeting, right, and you see the opportunity, we tell you, uh, in fact, not to uh, sign up tonight. We tell you, listen, we don't even want you to sign up, right? Because you know, hype is not going to get you success, but help will. Right. So why don't you go home, think about this a little bit, let the hype settle down, talk to your spouse and see if this is something you really want to pursue. And then after they come in with me, the first interview they come into, they uh, they come into the interview. We sit down give them an overview of what it's about. And then at the end of that, after we tell them what it's about, we say, are you ready to get started? And they say, yes. I say, great. Well, let's go ahead and start the part, first paperwork. But I'll tell you what, I don't even want to process this right? Until you come to three trainings to see if it's the right mm. fit for you. Okay. Okay. And then if it's the right fit, then you decide to pursue your license. But I don't even want to process your paperwork until you come to three consecutive meetings. I see. Okay. Well, what's the downside of WFG? Downside. Woo. The downside, I think, is not just WFG, but in any business that you start. Anytime an entrepreneur starts, Right. You have to front load it. Right. It's like it's like a plane taking off on a runway. Right. Sure. It's got to really get it going. Right. It's like uh, some people may not know what a 10 speed bike is in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you first start off, guess what? It, you you got to have that 10 speed in low gear and you got to give it all you got right at the very beginning. And so most people don't give it all they got in the very beginning. You know, they it, it's like let me tr let me dabble at it. Let me try. But if you just try, you know, to me I think trying is lying, right? It, it, when you say you try it means you're not going to do it. When you have a party and someone says to you, "Hey, you're going to come to my party?" and they say, "I'll try." You know what that means? <laughs> they're not coming. They're not coming. Does that make sense, right? <laughs> yeah. If they're going to come to your party, they say, "Yes, what would you like me to bring?" I'm going to be there a little bit late, but definitely I'll be there, right? Right. So, the the hard part about WFG is no one saying in the very beginning, it's changing your habits, right? So suddenly all these habits that you've had your life in your life have have kind of brought you to where you are. And how well has it worked for you? Right. So you got to change those habits up a little bit. And suddenly once you change your habits, you can actually start to see things that you never had before. Right. So the hardest thing for most people in WFG, the downside is all of a sudden changing their habits and starting to go, wow, this is a little bit weird. Right. Because I'm not used to getting off of work from nine to five and then having to go through a drive through or getting something quick to eat and then having to get to that training by seven o'clock to get trained from seven to nine. Right. Or I'm not used to uh, going to the meeting and then coming home at 10 o'clock. Right. After I sure. worked just eight hours. Right? right. But you got to make the sacrifices in the very beginning. And so I think that's the hardest part for most people. Right. The downside is you're going to have to make some sacrifice. Right. And, and, and surrender some things like your hobbies. Right. You're going to have to surrender TV. And, and I've interviewed a lot of successful people and I always ask them millionaires and billionaires. What's your favorite TV show? Right. And you know what most of them say? 
They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> That's right. I've got those same answers. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, they don't watch TV. Does yeah. that make sense? They sort of look right? at you, that blank look on their face like they're trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. they don't watch TV. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. you know, today, TV isn't going to pay you. P- TV is not going to reward your family the things that your family deserves to have, right? So I would tell you, you might have a TV screen in your house, but cut the cable. Cut your d- dish network or, or, or whatever the satellite TVs are cut it. Get rid of it. Get rid of your hobbies. Hobbies don't make you money, right? Hobbies are hobbies, sure. but, but you need to get rid of all those things and focus on a business. And if you were able to do that, then you'll, you'll reap the fruit of it all, you know? And so I think that's the, the downside of WFG is people don't like change. You know, people aren't willing to make different habits. What's been your greatest joy in, in WFG? Well, initially, my greatest joy was making money, right? Because, I mean, some people, I don't know why, they, you know, they don't like talking about making money. I, you know, I love some of these people who come into the company and say, I'm here because I want to help people. Well, for me, honestly, uh, I had no desire to help nobody. Does that make <laughs> sense, right? I, when I first joined WFG, it was about me. Absolutely, I was selfish. I had to pay my bills. I had student loans. I had credit card debt. I sure. had, uh, I'm the man of my house. I had to buy my wife a house. You know, we lived in a studio apartment with four walls. I mean, there were no walls on the inside. They were only on the perimeter. You know, I mean, I wanted to have bedrooms, you know? Right. And so. And LA's not cheap. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Even a studio is like 1200 yeah, bucks right, these days, yeah, you know, absolutely. in Los Angeles. And so I, I came here because I wanted to make money. But then after I made money, started making some money, you know, I was selling these products and, and I didn't realize what I was really selling, right? I mean, I knew it would benefit them, but I didn't know until I got my first death claim, right? And my first death claim to know that that family now has money to take care of their bills, their expenses, to provide some income for their family on a tax-free basis, on a, I should say, income tax-free basis, right? Right. And so that was... A wonderful joy, knowing that my clients and people who saved money in their in their plans that when an emergency came up, they actually had that money, you know. Or some people who in 2008, you know, during the big financial debacle when they lost their jobs, you know, most people who hadn't saved money were filing bankruptcy and losing their homes. Right. Well, most of those clients who had saved money with me had access to that cash, and they were able to use that cash to keep their family afloat. So that was a tremendous joy to sit there and go, wow, because of me, they didn't file bankruptcy. Because of me, their family isn't losing their house. Because of me, they're going to be able to retire in dignity. Because of me, their kids are actually going to go to college and not be in student loan debt, right? Because I educated their family and I got them to act on that education and start saving some money, right? But now my greatest joy has changed, right? Because your, your, your joys and your, your missions and your purpose changed through your, your career. And so for me, my, my joy now is taking somebody that has that burning desire and helping them to achieve their peak potential, to help them to realize that their capacity is so much bigger than where they are right now. And so to sit there and take someone like a Jamie or a Marla, or an Elon, or a Cash, or a Fredel, or, you know, the list goes on and on and on of the hundreds and thousands of people that I have influenced so that they can now live this dream that they're living today. And then I go to their house and I see the way they live. I see the cars they drive. I see where their kids are going to college. I see the kind of vacations they take, right? And the places they stay, right? That freedom and having all the choices, and all that happened because I sat there and took the time to, to mentor them and to coach them, right? To help them really, really uh, uh, hone in on their strengths, right? And not spend, go, go recruit somebody that has your weaknesses, right? But you focus on your strengths, right? And sure. increase that capacity of your strength. Uh, that is the greatest joy ever, you know? And so to see other people now becoming successful, you know, money is, is not a motivation for me. And there's no question. I always want to make more money, right? Because I want to increase my capacity, right? Well, how much sure. more money can I make? But, uh, but it's not my, my motivation. 